Good day, everyone. This is Evelyn Watts. I am the uh, product specialist from Corel and also the marketing manager for PaintShop Pro. Uh, today's shop class is going to be in, uh, covering a lot of information. Uh, what we'd like to do is show you more about the selection tools that are available in PaintShop, and not just for X4, but I know many of you are on the lines are in uh, previous versions as well. So what we'll do is show you tools that you have in previous versions and ones that are uh, newer in X4, just to, to make sure that all of you can really get the most out of the tools that you have uh, at hand. So today there is, again, it's a, a lot of information. So what we'll do is we'll start with uh, kind of some of the, the simple stuff, using basic selection tools. Then we'll get into a little more on uh, working with uh, masks and layers and some of the other tools that are in, uh, in PaintShop 4. Things like ex extracting objects or allowing you to do selective effects is, uh, on your images. So uh, what we'll do is uh, we're going to get started. Uh, you'll notice that I am in the edit mode in the paint shop. Uh, some of you I noticed are on uh, previous versions. Uh, you may have a slightly different workspace, but the edit mode is where we can find all of the tools that are available in paint shop. Um, what I have, uh, what I'm going to be looking at is found in the tool palette, in the toolbox here on the left hand side and it's, we're going to look at the selection tools to start with, just some basic ones uh, and then we'll get into a little more complex ones. Now some of you, uh, in fact even myself, I don't, uh, I don't always realize the number of tools that I have available to me because I, I kind of get used to what I'm comfortable with. Um, so what we'll start with is just kind of overview of what you have. Now what you choose to use and, and what uh, kind of what things you need to accomplish will depend what type of tool you end up using, but just to get a, a good gauge on what, what is available. So on the toolbox on the left, uh, third option down in this case, uh, if there's a little arrow for a flyout uh, and it shows a number of selection tools. Now again, it looks like there's only three, but there's actually a quite the combination when you look at how you can customize them. So to start with, I'm going to start with this first selection option here. Uh, and these are preset shapes. Uh, so things like rectangles or circles or stars or things of that nature. Uh, you can actually modify these in the options panel here just above where the image is. If I choose the selection type drop down, you can see some of these various options with arrows and triangles and so on. Um, we're going to do a very simple border shape um, on this image just to get started. So what I'm going to do is choose the rectangle, which is actually the default. So that's the selection type. We're going to be making a rectangle. Next to it is the mode or what you basically want the selection to do. So by default, it's probably set to replace. Uh, and what that means is if I click and drag to create the selection, and I, I start doing another one and I click and drag in a different area, what happens is this most recent selection is the only one available. So it actually replaces anything else that I may have selected. That's very handy, but it can also frustrate you if you've done this fantastic work creating a selection and then accidentally, you know, click and it's gone. So um, we have other modes here for uh, adding and removing selections. So if I choose to add, and you can see there is a shortcut key for this that I'm going to be using, actually. Uh, I just want to show you where it is in the menu. If I choose Add, and I click and drag again, it will add that selection together. So now I have one larger space. Uh, again, same applies here for Remove. It's going to remove a selection. So this is one way where we can create kind of interesting shapes from that area. So I actually am going to leave it as the default for replace and be using these keyboard shortcuts here. I find it easier to kind of be a little more flexible as I work. So what happens is if I create a selection, I'm going to create kind of something that's a border here. Uh, if I hold down the shift key, you'll notice that the cursor gets a little plus sign next to it. What that means is then if I start adding more shapes to it, obviously it's going to add to that selection. If I hold the control key down and I make a selected area, it'll remove that selection. Okay, so I just use shortcut keys to make it a little faster as I go. Uh, I'm going to get rid of the selection. Uh, to do that, uh, I'll show you where it is in the menu. Under the selection menu, you can choose to select none. I'll be using the shortcut key control and D to deselect. Okay, so control and D deselects everything. 
Now I wanted to create a simple border. It should be you know, the easiest thing to do, but sometimes getting it just right is a little difficult. So I can click and drag and I can make a selected area, but it's a little difficult to make sure it's exactly symmetrical. For instance, I want it to be even on all sides. Um, one thing that I find just the fastest way to do it, rather than figuring out pixels and all that good stuff, uh, I'm going to deselect and what I'm going to do is select the entire image. So, and again, if you go up to the menu under selections, you can choose to select all. I'm going to be using the shortcut key, just control A to do it. And it selects the entire image. Well, now we want to modify the shape. Instead of me using shortcut keys to try and start taking away, I'm not really sure what the dimensions are going to be. I want an equal border on this, on this image. What I'm going to do is up in the selections menu again, here we have options for uh, modifying our selections. So I can expand a selection that I've already made, I can contract it, I can do some feathering, and we'll touch on a couple of these other features here, but what I want to do is actually contract it. So, which means essentially I'm going to make the selection smaller. So if I use contract, I can now choose the exact number of pixels that I want to shrink this, and it'll be equal on all sides. So if I say 30, and you can see actually I have my preview on image checkbox clicked. So you can see if I contract it by 30 pixels, it's going to do the exact same dimensions all the way around. I know it's going to be an equal border. So let me say OK. And it's gone ahead and contracted that for me. So that's great, but I wanted to do something maybe on the edges of this image. Right now what it's doing is selecting everything on the inside of this rectangle. So again, back up to the selections menu. And there are shortcut keys for this, but I'm going to show you the invert, and basically it reverses it. So you'll see now I have a 30 pixel border all the way around here. Let me have this fit in the whole image. There we go. And you can see it's done an exact border all the way around. I know this seems like a lot of work, but once you've done it a couple of times, you'll know that you're getting a very, um, uh, a very precise look. Uh, and now we can do a bunch of things to it. We could uh, fill it with a color. We could uh, maybe do some brush work in here. A um, couple of things that I like to do. Yeah, let's see here. Uh, there we go. I clicked away from my screen. <laughs> OK, hang on a second. Let me invert that again. There we go. Uh, I'm just going to go up and do a simple adjustment. Uh, and again, there's always more than one way to to do any of the stuff that you want in Paint Shop. Um, but just for this sake, let's go ahead and maybe just adjust the levels in here. So I'm just going to go ahead, and I kind of did this a little bit before, but I'm just going to darken the edge. Let's just say OK. And that's the result. OK, nothing too crazy or mind-blowing, I know, but once you start building on a couple of these uh, easier techniques, you can start doing some pretty uh, intricate designs uh, with selections, being able to select even freehand, which we're going to get to next, uh, and then creating and, and being able to paint in designs on that. Now, one thing that I, I have done, uh, and we will get a little more, more into uh, layers, is hide my little go-to meeting panel. Um, I made the selection and applied a change right on the image itself. So over here in the layers palette, you'll see that that background image, is, there's just one layer, it's my photo, and I've made that kind of permanent change. So I've lost my selection, I've kind of deselected it, uh, and this, this change, if I wanted to go back and alter it, I have to hit the undo keys quite a few times to get back. So instead, let me go ahead and before applying that change, I just undid one step. I'm going to come over to the layers palette here and just at the bottom I'm going to add a new raster layer. I'm going to say OK and in this case maybe I'll fill it with a color instead. Now we do have a, a, a quick way to create borders uh, that are in the, uh, in the image menu but just so that you know how you can kind of customize it yourself. I'll just click and fill in that border and you can see that it's actually on a separate layer. So if I turn the eyeball off, make that invisible, my image has been left untouched uh, and that means it, it gives me a little more flexibility too if I wanted to go in and modify it later and, and 
them, maybe work on my background image again. So we'll talk a little bit more about uh, layers and masking layers in, in a few minutes. So that's the first of the selection tools, uh, just kind of preset shapes. And again, you can create uh, your own selections in here as well uh, and be able to reuse those, but I'll, uh, I'll talk about those more in a minute. The next one I want to get into is the freehand selection. Uh, now, this uh, actually has quite a number of, uh, of different uses, the way you can use it. I'm going to go ahead and change images here because working with the preset shapes is great if you wanted to do kind of very structured things, if you're working on, say, web graphics or borders or um, you know, things that have kind of regular shapes, uh, selections that you want to work with. But quite often, if you want to start modifying just selected areas of a photo, they're not always regular shapes. There's not a lot of things that are uh, kind of so easy as rectangles unless it's a sign. <laughs> so in this case, let me zoom in a little bit here so we can see it. Uh, if I wanted to modify the sky or the mountains or whatever it may be. Um, there's several ways you can do it, but I'd like to show you the freehand, uh, the freehand tools here. Okay, uh, let me zoom out so we can see that a little better. Uh, and not just, I should say, not just the freehand tools, but also how you can combine different types of selection tools together to kind of make your life a little easier and, and uh, move along a little faster. So we were looking at the selection tools just for regular shapes. Well, there is, the mountain's not a regular shape, but I can still use this tool. And I'm going to select the sky. Hang on a second here. Or the bulk of the sky, if I can. Uh, and now I want to add in this kind of a regular shape here. And I'm going to go ahead and use the freehand selection tools. Now, in the types, so just if we had different types of uh, squares and, and rectangles and so on. Under the uh, different types for freehand, we have uh, an edge seeker. Uh, so if I, actually, you know what would be smart of me is let's all zoom in so you can see a little bit better of what I'm talking about. Let me deselect all this stuff. Okay, so back in that freehand, if I go to edge seeker and I click and drag, I get a straight line. Uh, and what this does is as you start to click along the edge of a shape, it'll try and detect where that actual line is, the difference between here. So it actually will try and seek the edge. So I'm not um, dragging it. I'm actually just moving it around and clicking as close to that edge as I can because it's a quite an intricate shape. Okay, so you can continue on that way, and it's starting to try and do the work for me as it goes. You can see how it's trying to cling to the edge. That's one type of tool, uh, and again, it depends on what, um, what object you're trying to select, whether or not this is the most effective one. Uh, let me deselect that again, and I'm going to show you next the freehand. And freehand is exactly that. I'm, uh, just so you all know, I'm not using a mouse, um, especially with selection tools or freehand. I find it much easier to use a, a pen and tablet. So I, uh, the one I use personally is a Wacom Intuos tablet, and it has pressure sensitivity, which we don't need right now, but um, quite a number of features in PaintShop take advantage of that. So you actually get a lot more control out of what you're doing uh, when you kind of put away the mouse and, and start using a pen and tablet. So freehand is exactly that. It's basically like drawing a line. So it's a great quick way of grabbing bigger selections. Um, but again, it'll take you quite a bit of time if you want to try and draw along this edge all by yourself. I mean, if you've got the time, that's great. You know, could be you know, a good way to pass the time. But uh, there's faster ways to do it. So let me deselect this again. And we're going to go to the next type. This one is a point-to-point, -point. and again, in this case, it's not going to work so well for me, but just to show you the difference, the freehand was essentially um, hand-drawn lines, very curvy. The point is straight lines, okay? So just by clicking, it'll only give me straight lines. This is great for, um, uh, you know, very constructed shapes, signs, or um, buildings, or those kinds of things. And when you double click to close it, it will fill in that gap. Okay, uh, let's go next to the last one on the list, the Smart Edge. So Smart Edge is a little bit different. Let me just deselect everything. And as I drag it around, you'll see that it's got kind of a rectangular shape. And what that does is if you drag this shape over um, 
an edge. What it does is it's looking for the difference between the colors to try and detect that edge. So as I, I make small, short, little jumps along here and click and let it highlight that area as I go. There we go. So it's kind of just another way. It, it, the best and the obviously the easiest things is to, are to select like this are ones that have a very definite shape. Um, I'm not trying to do a, a fluffy cloud necessarily <laughs> for this one. That depends on you know how defined the object is. So if I come along and continue this way, and let me just continue on. I'm about to tell you about another shortcut key I love because I don't want to finish the selection. I'm not done, but I've kind of run out of mountain. If I hold down the uh, spacebar key, hang on a minute, let me go over here, spacebar key, I can just move along and hold down the shift key. There we go, or most of it. <laughs> and I can keep going along and so on. So, okay, let's just do the quick and kind of close version of this as I <laughs> kind of mess it up a little bit. I have to zoom out because I love my screen real estate. Okay. All right, holding down the shift key, I'm going to continue on with my somewhat sad looking little mountain. And I can go right across the edge at the top or in this case, if I miss a bit, let's just come along here, I can combine it with that uh, those preset shapes again. So I missed a bit here uh, and at the top, but just to make sure I've got everything, I'm going to go back and choose just that rectangular selection, hold down the shift key, and let's add the very top, and we'll add this bit here, and I'm just kind of clicking and dragging as I go, and it's not the worst selection I've made today, but I've got some little, little bits hanging out here, so I'm going to hold down that control key and just get rid of those pretty quickly. Okay, that was only mildly painful. <laughs> it did take more than a couple of seconds of work. Now here's the thing. If I click my mouse, um, my mode is set to replace, so I'm going to lose this selection. Not a big deal because you can you know, hit Control uh, Z or Z, depends where you're from, uh, to get it back. But the best advice um, I've ever gotten, and I usually forget until it's too late, is to see you can save selections. If you go up into the selections menu at the top, there's a couple of different ways you can save these. Um, down under load and save selections, you can actually save selections much like the preset shapes and they're saved as a, uh, I believe it's a PSP selection file. So you can actually bring those selections back uh, for any different image, reuse them as often as you want. Um, but you can also save selections to the alpha channel and that means it's saved with this image file. So if you save it as a PSP image, that selection is saved, which means you can go back and reuse it, access it again, use it on a different image. It's incredibly handy. So I'm going to save this selection, and you can see it shows me which files I have open, so I can actually save it to either image if I choose. Um, and you can also give it a name, and the white area here kind of shows what I have selected. I'm going to call this sky so I can remember what it was, and I can choose save. So now if I hit Control D to deselect everything, um, what I can do is go back up to my selections menu, load and save selection, and I can choose to load the selection from the alpha channel of this image. And now it shows me any of the ones I've saved, and I can have multiples, I can have, I don't really know what the limit is actually, you can have uh, a whole bunch of them saved that you can call back at any time. You can use it to replace whatever you have selected, or you can choose to add it to a current selection. Okay, so let me load that selection up and you'll see there it is right here. Now I have been working on this file a little bit before you guys got here. Um, so I do have a, a kind of a sky area selected. So that was cheating. Sorry, let me delete that layer because it's not fair. There we go. Okay, so back where we were. Um, now I have the selection saved and again um, I like to uh, basically work on separate layers so I have as much flexibility as I can and you know not as non-destructive as I can um, by keeping the pieces separate. Um, if I choose to create a blank layer now, um, 
I really don't have anything in there to kind of play with. I want to change the color of the sky. So what you can do uh, is I can actually copy this selection if I want. I could duplicate my image. Um, you also have options for pasting. If I go up to the Edit menu, you can actually paste areas as selections. Um, you can also paste as new layer. You can paste um, selections or objects as transparent selections. There's a lot of options in here for how you can work with these uh, selections. I'm going to stick with kind of the easy one for now. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy and paste. I'm using shortcut keys. So I'm using control C and control V to copy and paste. And it, uh, it pastes it onto a new image. But you'll notice that it threw it into the center of my image. Not exactly where I wanted my sky, although it is kind of a cool effect that the road completely disappears into oblivion. So let me do Control Z or Z, <laughs> uh, and instead what I can do is paste as new. Let me try a couple of these actually. It's funny that I don't always use these until someone asks me to. So when you paste as transparent selection, you'll notice that it hasn't plopped it anywhere. It actually let, leaves it hooked to my cursor so I can now position it if I wanted to. This is great if it's a, a separate object that you wanted to add to. I'm not too sure I'm going to get it dead on. Whoa, it was close. Very close. Kind of impressed. <laughs> let me undo that. And I'm going to go with my um, sure and steady safe method where I just go ahead, I'm right clicking on uh, the, the background layer. So if I right click on it, I get this uh, pop-up um, menu. I'm going to choose to duplicate. Okay. So this selection is going to apply changes to whatever layer I currently have active. So in this case, if I'm going to come in and let me just do something, nothing too crazy. Let's go to uh, the adjust menu. And I'm going to go ahead and just kind of saturate this a little more the other way and we'll make that a little darker kind of a dusky sky and we'll say okay all right so again if I let me turn that visibility off and then on and kind of see that it's choosing to create that selection or a modify what is ever is in that selected area Okay, so that was uh, combining different selection tools, the different types of freehand selections, but we've got one guy left here, and that's the magic wand. Now, the uh, I haven't even gotten into some of the other tools, but back in freehand selection, I do like to point out that you have options as well for uh, the feathering, or which is essentially the um, semi-transparent edge to a selection. So let me demonstrate that for you now. Um, if I go ahead and let me I'm be a little bit lazy. Let's pretend I'm drawing in a cloud at this point. So let me just use the freehand tool. And I'm going to bring the feathering up to about 20. And if I create a selection here, and let me go ahead and just fill that so you can see what it's done. You'll see that it's got a fuzzy edge to it. That's the feathering option that you have. I personally don't typically use it while I'm creating a selection. I like to have a little more kind of control over the end result. So what I'll often do is, let me undo this, get rid of that selection, control D, just to get rid of it. What I'll do is I tend to keep everything kind of at zero because all of these options here, if I create a selection here, I tend to go into the selections menu and under modify and that's where we I tend to go towards things like feather because I can see a before and after so I know what's going to happen before I actually make that selection um, you can also do uh, one of the other options with smoothing um, creating selection borders so again it's a little faster way to do it than I showed you but now you know the hard way <laughs> so if I go to feather you'll see in the before and after, it shows you kind of how um, soft and semi-transparent and how um, uh, far that uh, effect goes. So in this case, it's set for 21 pixels. If I made that quite a bit smaller, let's say 10, you'll see a preview of how, uh, how much feathering that's going to be. That's fantastic if you don't want that sharp, kind of looks like you used a pair of scissors kind of edge on something. It helps blend. Um, uh, the pixels across when you're using multiple layers. So this is a, 
preferred way for, for doing it because you can actually have a little more control on that. Okay. Uh, let me see. Okay, just checking on the panels. Um, I didn't mention at the beginning, but now would be a very good time. Um, for those of you who haven't used this webinar service before, um, there's a, the panel that you have on the left-hand side. There's actually a questions panel, um, and you can type in any questions that you have, um, which is great because it's better to write them down while you're thinking of them. <laughs> so that at the end of, uh, of this uh, session, what I'll do is try and leave about a good 10 minutes uh, and go over any questions that you may have had uh, while we're going through this. Okay. Um, okay, so irregular selections using the freehand tool and now for the magic wand. So I'm going to open up another image here. Uh, let's start with, let's see. Let's go with this one here. This is a good example. So uh, the magic wand tool is, it has a lot going for it, and I haven't always taken advantage of the ways that you can actually modify this. Um, you can actually, uh, where you click, uh, rather than clicking and dragging, when I click uh, anywhere in this image, right now it's going to look for any matching color for that pixel in that, uh, in that area. And the tolerance is how um, how broad a range of that particular color is it going to try and select for me. So if I choose this red area here and click once, this is what it found on the first go. Uh, I had the tolerance set fairly high. If I had that much lower, let me deselect everything. Let's say it was down to 9, a very low tolerance. And I click, you'll see it grabbed a much smaller area. That was all the, the different um, types of particular color that it found matching with a very low tolerance. But I can continue clicking. If I hold down the Shift key, it'll pick up small little sections. But this can be quite you know, time consuming. It might almost be easier just to draw out the selection instead. Uh, instead, what I'll do is I'm going to bring the tolerance up to about 26 and hold down the Shift key. And I'm going to add to the selection. And it starts grabbing much bigger areas. Now, one fantastic little checkbox that I didn't fully appreciate until recently <laughs> is this little one here in the options panel where it says contiguous. So right now what it's looking for is just uh, that particular color next to each other or in very close proximity to each other. If I deselect all of this, let me do that again, Control D to deselect, and I uncheck contiguous, it means that wherever I click, it's going to look for the, in the entire image, and it's going to try and find any matching reds. So you'll notice that it included reds that were red tones around the, uh, the stonework as well, uh, and that's because my tolerance was set fairly high. Uh, let me undo that and bring the tolerance down. So I don't want it to find you know, every single shade of red. I just want to find ones that start to match what this door is. So I can continue clicking as I go until I have a pretty good shape that I'm working with. Let's bring that up a bit for tolerance. There we go. That's getting a little better. Oh, a little too much. But you get the idea. So being able to change the tolerance of what you're looking for and where in the image is looking for it, is it right near where you just clicked or is it all over the image? There's also different types of modes. So in this case, it, by default, it's switching for color. But I can also look for um, anything that is transparent. So it can, it can select based on transparency or whatever is opaque or, uh, in this case, not transparent, uh, brightness and so on. So there's, depending on the type of selection or the type of image you're trying to work with, it's, uh, it's definitely worth some experimentation um, to find out what gives you the best result. Okay. Regardless, though, um, magic wands uh, don't always select everything that you want. Sometimes they select too much. So in this case, I, I don't really want to start using freehand, and there's a lot of little bits in here um, that I may or may not want. So editing selections uh, is fantastic. We've seen modifying them, contracting them, um, feathering them, and so on. But uh, in the selections menu, and on the Layers palette, you have the option to edit your selection. 
Okay, you can find it here in the selections menu, but also uh, in X4, you can find it here on the layers palette, this little brush and marquee area. So on the layers palette, just at the kind of the top of the, um, uh, right under the blending mode, I choose edit selection. What happens, let me turn that off again. When I click it, it creates what is essentially temporarily a, a mask layer, or what looks like one. And it gives me this red kind of color overlay so I can see what areas have been selected. Now the handy thing here is I can use the paint brushes. So let me go over to the tool box on the left. I'm going to choose the paint brush. And because it's treating it like a, a mask layer, uh, which is what we're going to be talking about in, uh, well, as we're getting into it, you can see, um, Anything that is in a gray scale, so the, let me see, here we go. It's showing me the, the 256 shades of gray that I can use. That, uh, the alpha channel that we mentioned, the mask layer, um, essentially what it uses is this gray scale to tell, uh, to tell um, the uh, application how transparent that uh, those pixels underneath are, or in the selection are. So right now, if I, let me zoom in a little bit so we can see a little better what we're looking at. So I'm going to use the, oops, zoom out, there we go, hold down the, hang on a second, there we go, ah, okay. Uh, I'm going to use the paint brushes to paint in uh, more of the selection to kind of add or remove it rather than using um, the other tools that we've covered so far. Now I can, uh, just a little tip that I find very useful. Um, this brush is really large right now so it's going to do probably more, more damage than good. Um, you'll notice in the options palette we have a ton of options. I'm not touching any of those right now. I just want to change the size. Now I can use the slider here at the top for size. I can type in, I can use the arrows to kind of you know, scroll up and down, choose the kind of size I want. But I find that if I hold down the Alt key and I click my mouse and I drag in towards the center of the cursor or out, it's a much faster way of resizing that brush without having to stop and kind of go up to the Options panel. So right now it's painting in with black. So it's removing that from my selection. I want to paint with, in this case, with white. So I just switched over to white. There's another quick tip here too. So you'll notice in the materials palette right now I'm uh, white is the foreground, black is the background. Let me go back to the way it was. So right now black is the foreground. And in this case all it's doing is adding or removing from my selection. So right now if I paint with black it's kind of removing that. If I right click without changing color it uses the background color instead of the foreground color. So instead of me going over to the materials palette to keep switching colors to add and remove, it's simply a matter of right click versus left click and keep painting. So I find that a little easier sometimes. Sometimes you get sick of it and you just want to change colors. That's okay too. Okay. So I can continue on this way. If you want to really detailed and get a very, very um, fine selection, this is a fantastic way to do it because I can now deal with things like transparency. So I've been painting in black and white, but if I start painting with a shade of gray, what happens is you'll see that that red overlay is just a little bit less dark. It means it's actually a little bit transparent. So if I start applying changes, they'll be less, um, uh, less visible in this kind of semi-transparent area. So I could paint all night, but you guys don't really want to see that, really. <laughs> So let me zoom out. So this selection right here, uh, I'm going to stop editing it. So on the Layers palette, I'm going to turn off Edit Selection, and you'll see this, this kind of temporary layer go away. Okay, but you'll see my marquee is still here. And now I can go ahead if I want to, uh, let's say, create a new layer or just simply change a color. I'm going to go really easy here and just go up to my, let's say, Adjust menu. And let's go ahead and, I don't know, Let's change the hue on this one again. Let's make that green, just for the heck of it. Okay, so again, many different ways to use these selection tools. Um, you can get really, really detailed, um, and again, you'll probably spend a bit of time doing it and getting it just so, so please make sure you save. 
In this case, I go up to Save, uh, sorry, Selections, and I can then save the selection to this image file, to the alpha channel. And again, it's showing me all of the images that I have available, so I can save it to anything. And I'm going to call this, well, I guess it's a green door now, but Save. So when I deselect it, or I open this image up again later, so save it as a PSP image file because it saves a ton more information than a JPEG possibly can, including things like layers. Um, I can go back at any time and then yeah, use this selection again to modify it or to, to really apply it to a different image if I want to. It's completely up to, well, it's completely up to you. So that's, uh, that's one way to do it. Another tip that I have is kind of doing the reverse of what you think you want to do. So let's say, uh, in this case, let's try this little goldfish here. So let me deselect. I was working on this earlier. If I wanted to select this little guy, uh, there's, well, there's a couple ways to do it. Uh, I've already removed the background, actually. Um, what I would do is use the magic wand. And the great bit is that there's no color in this background. It's actually already cut out. So when I select it, it's selected everything but the fish. I can go up to the Selections menu, Invert, and now I have my little fishy. So if I wanted to, I could, say, copy him and put him in a very unpleasant place. Poor guy. So mean. Let me just control paste. And there's my little fishy sitting off, probably very thirsty. Oh, that looks really sad, actually. Okay, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Um, now, how did I select him? Um, I actually used another tool I want to talk about. So right now, everything you've seen me do has been manual, so using selection tools. Um, let's say I wanted to take a shortcut. All right, so one of the shortcuts you can do is, let me go back to my little fishy, and let me, I'm going to go to the edit menu, and I'm going to revert, did I save him? Hang on a second. Oh, I did. All right, so I already saved my changes. Luckily, oops, I did that too quickly for most, sorry. Um, by default, whenever you save an image in PaintShop, it will restore, uh, sorry, it will back up the original. Um, that's not something you maybe always want to do, but in my case, I really like having to, being able to go back to the original. So I can restore that original file, and this is the little guy that I was working on. Now, something I did, I could use, uh, if I wanted to, to select him, I could use any of the tools I would just talk about. Uh, probably the first thing I would do is probably the um, magic wand tool because I'm fortunate enough to be dealing with a fairly flat background so it would be easy enough to pick up the colors. But instead, um, these aren't necessarily, I guess, selection tools, but if you wanted to extract objects um, quite uh, and combine them with other images, a great place to check out would be under the image menu we have the object extractor. So the object extractor isn't going to create a selection so much as going to do some of the deleting for you. So it's a, it's a fairly straightforward kind of thing. you got three tools. That's about it. So you can brush to draw around the object you want to keep. The next tool is to fill in to make sure it knows what is the meat and potatoes of what you want to extract. And, of course, erasing brush marks to try and refine your selected area. So with the, the um, brush tool selected, I'm going to give this guy a little outline. And I like to give it enough so that it knows where the edge is. So basically a little bit of what you want and a little bit of what you don't want kind of helps it figure out where that edge is. Uh, now, it would be faster if I probably used a bigger sized brush, but the finer you can go, typically the better the results are. It depends on, on how um, irregular the edges are of the object. So I've done a little general brush around. I'm going to use the bucket tool now to fill in and say, this is the part I want to keep. I could also say, you know, click on the outside and say, this is what I want to keep. I have to let it know what is the guts of what the selection is going to be. So I filled it in, and I'm going to choose process. And it's really hard to see what the heck just happened. I know. <laughs> so what I do is, there's a little checkbox here to hide the mask so that I can see how it turned out. Now, if it's not quite right, um, what you can do is adjust the level of detail. So I can bring the detail down and see if that makes a difference, or I can try and have it 
be much more judgmental with that layer. And this is where I start to lose a bit of stuff because, again, the, the better your or more accurate your outline is, the better the results will be. Um, so I don't really want it to be that accurate in this case because the object is you know pretty simple and it looks pretty good right here. So if it doesn't, you can go back to the edit mask. Let me just turn that mask back on so we can see it. And it'll give me a chance to either erase a little too much information or make it a, a different uh, selection here. So I want to let it know, yes, I want to keep this. And process, and OK, and there's our fishy. So if I wanted to use him in something else, I certainly can. Now, there is another tool as well, which, since we're talking about object extraction, that I find quite useful. It's, it's not new to X4, so anyone on these, this webinar or anyone viewing this later, um, we are recording it, and it will be available um, after the event, uh, it has access to the background eraser. Now, the background eraser is, again, in the toolbox here. Uh, if you don't see it, it looks, it looks like a little pencil eraser sitting on top of an image. If you don't see it there, the drop-down probably has the eraser selected. So you can toggle between these two. I'm going to go with the background eraser. And it's a ginormous size right now, so let me hold down my Alt key and make that a little smaller. OK, a couple of things. Um, there are a ridiculous number of options for modifying this tool. Um, I know, <laughs> it looks like a lot, um, but as you start to experiment with a couple of them, um, you'll find that it, it's quite an advanced tool and gives you a lot of options, a lot of flexibility for, for basically um, removing backgrounds from, uh, from objects. So what happens is if I click on my canvas, anything that's touching that pen right now, it's going to start erasing anything that matches the kind of colors and textures in there. So as I drag around, you'll notice that it's removing that background, but it's not touching the little, even the hairs on this little boy's head. So as I come around, and I want to get rid of this green, so if I just touch the green, you'll notice that it starts to find other tones, and I don't really want that. So I can undo, or just like the eraser tool, if I right click, it brings that detail back in. Okay, so one of the things that this is trying to, it's, uh, it's looking for matching color everywhere. One of the things, let me undo this again, okay, um, that I found, I don't play with a lot of these settings because it is easy to kind of get lost in the options, um, but you do have the limits or how far do you want this tool to go. If you look at trying to find the edges on an object, that's great if you have something with very solid lines. So I choose Find Edges. Okay. Okay. You'll notice that it does a better job. It's a more restrictive. It didn't go ahead and try and find anything in this little face and try and delete that. So it's a it's a little more restrained. Um, if you use it on a tool that has lots of similar color, uh, an image with lots of similar color, like for instance, if I start working over on his shirt here, as soon as I click on his shirt. It's, it's set for finding um, uh, edges, so it's having a hard time erasing anything. So on the, the limits drop list, I'm going to say continuous. Keep looking for a color that in this area that matches it. And you'll see now it's doing a much better job. Of course, he looks a little disembodied now, but it'd be great to put his head on someone else's body. <laughs> okay, so the tool will, will modify depending on how you're trying to use it. If you had an example like this guy down here, this little... Um, uh oh, iguana. Okay, phew, I think. <laughs> I just <laughs> blanked out for a second here. Um, if I use something like find edges, even though there's a lot of green in here, it's going to actually try and detect where that color shift is and not delete the green lizard from the green background. Let me undo that and change it again. So if I change it to discontinuous means it's going to try and find anything that matches in that circle. You'll see that as I start using it, it's finding all the other greens and it's starting to erase parts of its body, which isn't really what I want. So uh, different ways to use the tool, uh, very, very powerful, but even if you just leave everything well enough alone, leave it as its defaults, it is set up to be as general purpose as, uh, as possible for you know, most edits, 
Um, but if you need to, feel free to go in and start mucking around with some of those options. You'll see that you get a lot of lot of options out of these tools. Okay, that's a lot of information, I know, which is why we record these webinars so you can go back and look at them later. Now, that was selection tools and some of the uh, other options like background eraser and object extractor to help, you know, bring out or cut out the objects that you want from your photos. But what happens if you want to start combining things instead? Uh, where, where do we come in when we start talking about um, masks, uh, mask layers? So in this case, what I'm going to do is, and I hadn't really decided because there's so many options, let's say, uh, let's say I wanted to add this, let's say, you know what, no, this is going to be better flying without a net a little bit, but that's okay. I'm going to revert this image back to before uh, before when it was last saved because I don't really want this border and everything else. So let's say these little guys here are going to go in a different image. I want to combine photos together. I'm going to copy it and where should they go? I'm thinking, thinking the desert because it seems really bizarre. Let me undo a couple steps and get rid of our poor little fried fish. You just delete him. Okay, so here's our desert image. I'm going to control V and paste our teeny tiny kids. Hang on a second. I'm just using the pick tool here to make them a little bit bigger. Okay, and we're going to have them in this image here. Now I haven't done any selections. I haven't done um, any cutouts or anything like that. So I've got it, I plopped it right in here. What I can do is instead of um, doing all my selections beforehand, what I'm going to do is go ahead and add a new mask layer. Now I have the options to, sh to hide all or show all. So I'm going to add a mask layer right above these two kids jumping. And I want to show everything. Okay. So what it gives me is what looks like a completely blank layer. And you'll notice that, hang on a minute, let me make sure this is true. Yes, it is true. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, notice the materials palette. I have access to all the different colors to paint with. Well, when I go ahead, I'm going to come back in and add that mask layer again. I'm going to say show everything. Show me that. Don't hide that image from me. I want to start deciding what gets hidden. You'll notice that the color palette here is now only grayscale. When you're on a mask layer, that's your only option. You can only paint in black, white, or shades of gray because it's determining what part of this image below do I want to be transparent or what part do I want to be um, basically masked um, so I can't make edits to it. So with the brush tools, I'm going to go ahead and choose the, the paintbrush over here. There's, I can use the selection tools as well. I'm going to use the Alt key actually just to make this brush a little bit bigger. As I start painting with the brush, you'll notice, well in this case I'm using a gray, so I'm getting a semi-transparent. It's actually showing what parts are being hidden. I'm going to go ahead and set this back to black and white because it's all or nothing <laughs> with black and white. That was actually rather profound. <laughs> Um, and I can use the paintbrush tools if I want to. I can also go ahead and use the selection tools. Um, now, using this is going to get pretty sloppy pretty quickly because there's a lot of detail in here if I wanted to mask these guys out. So what I can do is if I choose to, let's say, turn the mask on. There we go. Okay, so what I just did in a haphazard way. <laughs> is if you want to see exactly what it is you're painting and where you're working, on the layers palette, there's this little mask option. Uh, and it might be in a different location in previous versions. I don't know offhand. But as I toggle it on and off, it shows me what areas um, I've been, I've been uh, kind of hiding or showing. Okay, it also... Like, oops, let me go back in here. I can go ahead at the same time, but because it's basically a, a black and white layer, I can use the selection tools as well. So if I wanted to, let's say, select an area, I can rush that area in. Okay, so the selection tools work as well. You don't have to necessarily do it on images before you copy or paste them in. Um, I can go ahead, I'm going to deselect that. I can zoom in, I can keep working on here if I want to. Basically, all I'm doing is painting on a black and white area. So if I hide this, 
you see that the image that I have underneath is completely untouched. So this is a very, very flexible way of allowing you to make changes and show or hide something. Or in this case, let me say, um, um, instead of selecting and modifying part of the image, I can use the mask tool on just a single image if I want. So right now I'm showing and hiding pieces. So this is great if you wanted to do a collage. Um, or if you're <laughs> so inclined to putting um, someone else's head on some other person's body and those kinds of things. But I can also, let me minimize this, I'm going to hide this for now. With just this background layer, I'm going to duplicate this. So I'm right clicking, duplicating, and I'm going to add a mask layer here as well. So you can do multiple masks uh, within groups as well. So let me show all and say, you know what, I just want to, let's say, actually let me hide the bottom here. Let me go ahead and make a change. I can either hide the bottom so I can see what I'm masking in or out. Uh, this is kind of backwards of what I would normally do, but we're again, no net sometimes. So let's say I'm going to essentially mask out this guy. This is, for me, a little easier sometimes than using that mask overlay because I can actually see the checkerboard a little more easily. But it's just personal preference. We're combining a lot of different tools tonight. There we go. And I'm right-clicking to paint back in with white because I didn't want to hide that. So you can see that masking is literally that. It's actually hiding whatever is the image underneath. Let me turn on my background again. Because I duplicated it, you absolutely see no difference, right? But let's say that in this image, I wanted it to be black and white. Let me just say, do something, let's go to, actually, let's go to Colorize. So that was in the Image menu. Green is an interesting choice, but that's all right. All right, let's go. <laughs> okay, this is funny having a little too much fun, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. So what you'll see is this entire image is purple, but when I masked out the sky, it means that everything but that sky, everything but the black area is invisible. So I'm actually seeing what's underneath, the sky underneath. So this is one way of that you can actually layer um, images together using masks. This is a great way to do um, um, kind of that tinted black and white effect. So if I wanted to have a, a black and white image here, let me just use my paint brushes, I could say, essentially just using masks, what part do I want to be exposed? Do I just want purple mountains? Then I'm just going to see that everything else but the purple mountains is hidden. This is pretty sloppy, but again, I think you guys get the idea. So yeah, a lot of different options. I know we covered a lot, but the selection tools can be as very basic as just creating a border, or you can go so far as to create multiple mask layers and bring in different objects and have the selective edits on different areas as well. Now when you save this as a PSP image file, these mask layers are saved, anything that selections that you've saved in the alpha channel, so up in the selections uh, menu as well, those are all saved. Um, so there's really no, uh, no problem going back and forth. When you do want to save it out, to say um, post it somewhere, say uh, if you want to go have it printed uh, from a printer, if you wanted to post online, you'll be saving it to a JPEG file. Um, JPEG files are flat. They don't, have a, they don't store all of this extra information. So it's always good to have a, keep a backup for yourself if you ever want to go back and, and not have to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. Uh, you'll have a lot more options by saving it as a PSP image file um, and then being able to export as a JPEG for print, for web, or really whatever you like. So I've taken up a ton of time and I've covered a ridiculous amount of information. <laughs> so I'm pretty positive that you'll have questions. So I'm going to come over here to the questions panel. And I have a couple in here. I've got some fantastic tips as well. So you guys are, some of you guys are quite the gurus on uh, paint shop. Uh, so there are a number of options. Again, the, uh, the webinar is recorded because I flew through a bunch of things. I didn't even cover half of what I wanted to, but <laughs> that's what happens when you only have an hour. 
Um, the if you have any other questions, actually now's the time. Um, uh, we do have a tip though. When I said earlier, I wasn't sure where the let me just hide part of this webinar bit. Um, that mask. If you look on the layers palette, uh, the highlight mask area is in every version. You'll find it at the top. For some reason, I thought it'd been moved, but no, <laughs> it's, it's right up there. Um, the one tip that I didn't show that I just um, discovered recently and totally made me realize that I wasn't insane <laughs> is if I, uh, let me see, let me open up a new image here. Um, okay, this guy here, no big deal. Let me do a, just a simple selection. So I'm just going to select an area. Now, this is a trap I've fallen into for years, not realizing how it was intended. If you click and drag a selection, you'll see that it's actually cut out that area and it's it's moving it around. And on the layers palette, you'll notice that it's been actually promoted to kind of floating selection. So when I deselect or I move on, um, let me deselect that. It's actually changed it. It's not really what I wanted. I just wanted to move that selected rectangle because I didn't get what I wanted. So let me undo that. Instead of, instead of um, clicking and dragging it to move it this way, uh, if you right click, okay, undo is my friend here. If I right click, what it does is allow me to drag just the selection without cutting out anything in there. Okay, so if you right click and drag, you can reposition. If you left click and drag, it actually will cut and move that piece for you. Okay, so just a tip to make some frustrations go away is yes, you actually have two options when you create a selection when it comes to moving it. Um, we do have a selection on showing and hiding when it comes to mask layers. I didn't explain that and I apologize. Um, when it comes to mask layers, uh, let me see if I can go back to where I was. Where's my little Vegas fun? There we go. Okay. Um, show all and hide all. Let me get rid of this stuff here. Let me get rid of it. Uh, okay. So we have two images. I've got a purple one and a, the normal one. If I want to create a mask over this because I want to kind of hide parts of it so I can see what's underneath, when you add a mask layer, if you say hide all, what it does is it creates um, a black mask instead of a white one. So it means that if I basically you have to decide how much of the image do you want hidden. Do you want most of it hidden or very small parts of it because that will determine how much painting work you basically have to do or selection work you have to do. So if I say, uh, let me undo, let me trash that again. So let's say I want um, everything but the mountains to show. So I only want purple mountains. That's really not a lot to select. I can paint those bits in pretty quickly. So when I add a mask layer, I'm going to say, I'm going to say hide all. So it's going to essentially hide this entire image by covering it with that black layer, that black mask layer, which means that when I come to use my paintbrush or selection tools or whatever, uh, if I paint in with white, then painting in with white, actually let me scroll down so you can see, there we go. So you'll see that it's adding white to that mask layer. White is the part that's going to get shown through. And I'm actually right clicking, so just to make it very obvious, painting with the foreground color. Okay, so it's just a, a matter of what's the easiest thing to try and select. Um, if it's easier to just paint in a little bit, then I would say hide the whole thing because it's easy just to paint in a little bit to, to have it show. If it's uh, if you have a lot that you want to show, I just say show me the whole image and I'll just find the little bits that I got to get rid of. So it, there's no real big difference except the kind of your preference and the amount of work that you might have to do. So in this one, it starts with a black background, so I only have to expose what little areas I want with the white. Uh, and the reverse is true if you wanted to, to show all. It would show everything in white. So I just had to paint in the little black with a black brush, just the areas that I wanted to, uh, wanted to get rid of. It's kind of a convoluted answer. Don't worry, because sometimes I still have trouble remembering what black versus white does and which gets hidden. I have to stop and think about it sometimes. 
Um, okay, so we have kind of run out of time. Um, I do want to let you know that we have, this is our third shop class. Um, we're doing these on a monthly basis. Um, on uh, just recently, uh, we had archived them, uh, meaning we've uploaded them to the GoTo meeting service that we're using right now, and I'll, I'm going to do the same with this recording. But I've also just recently been able to send them over to our YouTube channel. So under on YouTube.com, if you go to uh, Corel Paint Shop Pro, um, you'll find the last two uh, shop class seminars on there. They're a little long. They're about 45 minutes each when I trim out all of my talking. <laughs> um, but they're, they're definitely well worth watching. We'll be doing another session uh, next month. I have uh, just yet to pick a date. <laughs> um, but what you'll be getting, I'm, when I, we end this webinar in about 30 seconds, <laughs> you're going to be presented with a survey. Uh, and the survey is kind of geared to help us figure out what topics you'd like to hear more about, whether or not the, the webinar is working for you, if there's anything else that we can do. Because really, we just want to make sure that you're getting the most out of the software that you have. Um, and enjoying it, really, because there's a ton of power in here that we don't always, you know, you know, toot our own horn on how amazing Paint Shop is, because really it is, a, it's a powerhouse. So being able to show you how to get in there and kind of dig through the tools and, and discover new stuff is, is huge. And if we can help you do that with different topics or um, if you've got problems that you want to find solutions for, let us know. Let us know, because that would be, uh, really help me out when I have to kind of come up with new cool things to show you guys. <laughs> okay, so I want to thank you guys very much. Um, you'll be getting a, a, a survey right after this, and the webinar will be available and accessible through the same link that you registered with. We'll post it on Facebook, though, so you can get access to it. Uh, and then shortly, I'll be adding it to our YouTube channel, where we'll be uh, kind of storing all of our, our webinars and our tips and tricks that we keep getting in and kind of growing that for more resources. So thank you very much, guys, uh, and have a great night. Thanks for coming out.